Okay. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, everyone who's online joining us now. We're back at the Heinrich Perl Stiftung in Berlin to continue with the our conference, Central Banking and Its Discontents. Um, we're going to start off today with a keynote speech by Mark Blythe. Mark is the William Rhodes Professor of International Economics and a Professor of International and Public Affairs at Brown University. He's written extensively. Um, amongst his most famous books is the history, uh, Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea. And I just want to share a little anecdote that got me more um, familiar with, with Mark. After I read this book, I was looking for secondary references, and then I found this article he published in the Jacobin, I think, where he describes how the SPD um, Friedrich Herbert Stiftung invited him to give him an award about this book. And Mark showed up and basically told him, have you actually read my book? You're not, you're not supposed to be giving me an, an award um, if you take it seriously. Without further ado, Mark, you. your floor. So thank you for the invitation to be with you today. I'm going to keep this mask on. I keep testing negative for COVID, but I don't feel 100%. So hopefully we're OK and we'll just go with that. And to anyone I had dinner with last night, my sincere apologies. Right. Um, OK, uh, so this was an unusual one for me because I don't think I've actually written anything about central banks. I've mentioned them in passing. But I don't think I've actually really done anything. So in conversation about what I should do with this, um, we came up with this idea of, well, I should think about other things that I've done and use that as a lens to talk about central banks. And that's what I'm going to try and do here. So I'm going to talk about this idea of a macroeconomic regime, how it's kind of a time-dependent construction, how central banks possibly fit within that framework, how they evolved historically how the regime that supports that particular set of institutions may have kind of passed its sell-by date. And if we're in an interregnum between different regime types or moving into a new regime, what does that mean for the practice of central banking? So the first part is set up, and the second part is essentially a series of questions that I think would constitute, if you will, a research agenda going forward on central banking, or at least the type of questions that I would find useful to ask, and I hope they're useful to you as well. So. Uh, when thinking about this, I started to think about the sociology of professions. So Len Seabrook, who many of you know, has uh, been writing a lot about this stuff. And at first, I was very skeptical of this literature, you know, the notion that professions were very important, etc. And then the more I got into it, the more I realized how incredibly insightful this literature is. And one part of it is the notion of insider versus outsider knowledge. And if you apply this to central banking, you can basically get to this, you know. So what's the, what's the upside of being an insider? Well, you have highly detailed knowledge, expert credentials, personal and network experience. And the downside is the critique from outside is you can't see the wood for the trees. You basically get trapped into the detail. And you confuse things like legal mandates with natural laws. These are not natural laws. You, as Draghi has shown, you can interpret a mandate pretty much any way you want. Now, the outsider perspective on this, someone who doesn't come from that tradition, put myself in that frame, I'm possibly a good tree spotter. Right? You don't get confused by the little details. You're trying to look at the bigger picture. Um, also, you come with knowledge of wider ecosystems. How do these things fit into broader institutional complexes? Um, to use a Kuhnian analogy, I'm not part of the project, so I'm not embedded in the normal science project. You can take a broader view of what's going on. And the downside to this, of course, is that I don't know what I'm actually talking about. I'm kind of bullshitting my way through it. And I really don't understand the importance of mandates, which may be entirely true as well. So we'll go with that. Now, uh, here's the other way of thinking about this. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, reflecting on sort of the tumult of Trump and all the rest of it, the Review of International Political Economy said, do you think you could write something that's kind of an IPE perspective on the rise of populism? And I did, and I did it with Matthias Matthias. And, and in the process, we came up with this idea of a macroeconomic regime. This is very similar to what Baccaro and Pontusen were talking about in the notion of growth models. And think of it as very much as the IPE complement to that CPE concept. And what we were getting at was, 
If you think about kind of the post-war order, the golden era institutions, Le Trente Glorious, they were all different means to an end. It doesn't matter whether you were practicing a very supply-side driven economy like classic Ren Maiden or Sweden, or you were pushing very much demand-side economics and stop-go policies like the United Kingdom. You agreed on one thing. The point of the project was to make sure that we never went back to mass unemployment. Because if you did, people went fascist and communist and bad shit happened. So it didn't matter how you got there. The point of those institutions was to produce unemployment, uh, was to produce full employment rather than unemployment. So we settled on this idea of a macroeconomic regime as, as a set of institutions that are defined by a particular policy target. Um, so the definition we work with is economic policy targets embedded within dedicated institutional complexes that are both generative of and contingent upon the production of those targets. And the key idea we were playing with is that these things endogenously undermine themselves over time. That is to say, they can be hit by exogenous shocks, and exogenous shocks tend to be the way we think about why institutions change. But in fact, it may be endogenous dynamics that are more important here. So... I tried to explain this once to a tech audience. Um, so a few years, backstory on this with austerity. Um, when I started writing the austerity book, I wanted to meet bond market vigilantes because apparently they're very bad people who, who want to destroy countries. And yet I knew a few people who were bond traders and people like that, and they didn't seem to be particularly evil and malicious. So uh, in order to meet them, I had to go to their conferences. And, and you start to notice the sort of the net. There's 1,500 finance conference, dedicated finance conferences around the world every year, at least in normal times. And the average price of admit to a specialized bond market conference is about $5,000. Yeah, that's how these things make money. Um, so there are big networking opportunities for people in finance. And I decided I needed to get into those conferences. So the only way you can do this is if there's gains in trade. I knew some stuff about European political economy. They were worried about European bond yields. Let's do gains in trade. I start talking at these conferences. You make your network. You do your research. It's great. I got interested in tech. And I got interested in tech because around 2010, you'll probably remember this, right as the sort of full force of the financial crisis begins to hit, every single high-end publication starts to talk about how everyone's job's going to be replaced by a robot. Exactly at that moment. It was incredible. Across all of the quality publications, Financial Times, everything. And we had, you know, the, the race against the machine and all this sort of stuff, and this time it's different. And I thought, there's something really odd going on here, because I just don't think most of this is true. So I pulled the same trick. I wanted to talk to tech people to find out if this was really true or not. You get to go to the tech conferences, blah, blah, blah. What's the gains in trade? They're kind of interested in global macroeconomics, but they have no facility for processing it. So I had to come up with a frame that allowed me to talk to tech people. This was it. And the frame was, imagine capitalist institutions are the hardware on a computer. And imagine the economic ideas of the software that governs it. And at any given point in time, there's a sort of set of configurations which are possible in the hardware, Swedish social democracy, American capitalism. And there's a set of ideas which more or less are the code which will allow those systems to run. And if you start to think this way, the, the point about endogenous destabilization becomes much more interesting. Because if you overrun a system, if you overtax it, if you keep adding lines of code that are not part of the native code, what happens is you start to build bugs into the system. So that's how I started to think about this. So if you think about this as either time-dependent macroeconomic regimes or two economic computers, it becomes very clear that there's a big transition that happens around 1980. You move from a full employment policy target, very national economies in terms of people are sometimes allowed to, to quote Brendan Greeley on this, uh, people are sometimes allowed to move, products are usually allowed to move, capital really wasn't allowed to move in this period. Restricted financial markets is a color of that. COLA contracts, cost of living adjustments, big capital, big labor, various forms of corporatism. High taxes and transfers, the labor share high, the capital share low. And crucially, fiscal dominance. Right? At that point in time, central banks are not important. And one of the ways you knew this was nobody knew the name of the person who ran the central bank. It was very, very different. They were the check cashing agencies for the treasury. Then around 1980, the policy target radically changes. And regardless of how it's calibrated, it's basically price stability becomes the thing. 
Rather, national economies, we set about globalising production chains, opening up financial markets, flexibilising labour markets, lowering taxes, lowering transfers. And the result after this of 30 years is a reversal in the capital labour share and, of course, monetary dominance becomes the way that we think about the world. So you've got two very different sets of regimes that transit at a very, very quick place. Why, why that transit? Well, what was the bug, if you want to continue that analogy? And it was inflation. And, you know, we're back there again. We're happy to talk about that later on. Well, I will talk about that later on. But that's what crashed the first one. Right? Very, very straightforward. Essentially, when you're running very, very tight nationalised labour markets over a long period of time, because a very Kalekian story is the simplest story, you basically bid up the median wage, and your skilled workers become to earn, sup earn superordinate rents. As you do this, profit share collapses, capital revolts, breaks the, b the bargain, and off you go. So, you know, when it failed, there was, a, first of all, a political revolution, which is the rise of neoliberal politics. That new policy target of price stability sounded very innocuous, but it was about one thing in particular, restoring the value of capital. It was about restoring the capital share. Then there was a new policy mix that goes along with this, liberalise, privatise, flexibilise, globalise, you know, and raise interest rates. And the political coalition that makes this possible is the one that's been basically suffering through the inflation decade, which is what Jakob Fagan has usefully called the rise of the deflationary bloc. Right? So they've got a whole sort of series of actors and ideas pushing in the political sphere. This, is enabled, this enabled and was enabled by a simultaneous change in the way that we thought about the economy. And I wrote about this extensively in Great Transformation, so it's kind of interesting to see it coming back now in various ways because of this kind of inflationary moment. The first one was, of course, the monetarist critique of the Phillips curve, the idea of expectations augmentation, which then leads you to a Nehru. The rational expectations revolution, which gives you the policy irrelevance proposition of the first one says you'll get in trouble. The second one says don't even try it because it's pointless. You have the public choice critique of the state as essentially rent seeking rather than redistribution in any positive sense. Add all that together, you get time and consistency and credibility arguments, which gives you the actual original CBI literature. You get the Chicago, uh, other Chicago school critique of basically corporations having a social function and the notion of shareholder value, et cetera, and consumer surplus. And eventually, the sort of the new Keynesian accommodation with all of this happens because it's a modeling contrivance. Once you accept the idea of a representative agent to get around the sort of the sunspot problems, which are endemic in the big models, then you bolt that together and you get DSGE, and that gives you the workhorse for central banks to go off and do their stuff. This all leads to what Kate McNamara usefully called the pragmatic monetarist consensus of the mid-90s that leads to the big hardware modification. Right? So if you think about what that breakdown was, the really important hardware modification on this was the rise of independent central banks. So what does this policy mix give you, this new policy mix of flexibilize, liberalize, you have a NATO to deal with, etc.? It means that fiscal policy, don't try it. And whether you're a small, open European economy that thinks most of it leaks out, so there's no point in the demand stimulus, or whether you're a larger economy and think everything comes from the supply side, so you basically have to uh, take the Nehru as a fact. So you basically de you, you de emphasize, you get away from the notion that fiscal policy is even possible. So the appropriate policy now becomes micro supply side policies with monetary support. And for a while, that worked, right? That seemed to work. If the goal was to restore the capital share, check. If the goal was basically to disinflate these inflated economies, check. Then this worked. And for a while it did. I love that group photograph. It's really great. And that, of course, is the great moderation, this reduction in volatility that you see beginning in the mid-90s uh, all the way through to the beginning of the financial crisis. Now, that was covering up some important stuff. So what was the stuff that it was covering up? If what was being covered up last time was the inflation bug in the software of the post-war model. What was doing it this time was the pay productivity link and wage stagnation. So the chart on the left is the famous one of the most extreme version of this, which is the US and the decoupling of pay and productivity. But what you also see in those different charts, there are various European countries, and it's quite remarkable how different they are 
in terms of what happens to the 10th percentile's wage growth in the US versus France, for example, and then how they actually remarkably track together in the UK, which actually looks like a better outcome until you realise how low the growth rates are and how skewed that distribution is to begin with. So you actually have, even though it looks very dim quite different, a similar story of basically pay for the, down to the 60th percentile really isn't doing very much. So how do people keep going when wages aren't growing? You borrow, and that red line is bank assets. One of the ways that I love to sort of freak out my undergraduates in, in, in my basic sort of IPE class is to tell them the following story. Uh, I get the, the class to basically sit in there and I'll say, can you tell me what an asset is? And they'll come up with some idea of what an asset is, and we'll work on that for a while, and we'll plant this idea. And I say, can you tell me what a liability is? And then we'll work on that for a while. I say, okay, that's great. So then they need to match, right? And they're like, oh, great. And they get the insight of a balance sheet, et cetera. And I go, oh, by the way, the one group of people in this world for whom that's not true are bankers. Because everything a banker regards as an asset is everybody else's liability. <laughs> And what that means is when banks talk about our massive asset footprint, they have literally given out billions of dollars in loans and they hope they're going to get some of them back. That's the essence of the project. So when you have a lack of real wage growth, but at the same time you're pushing risk onto individuals away from public institutions, then people take on lots of credit in different forms to cushion this. And the notion of the models that we had of intergenerational smoothing through credit, et cetera, et cetera, at the time all made sense. There was no problem in borrowing because your wages are always going to be higher later than they are today, except that didn't happen. So you just end up with this great levering, as Alan Taylor called it. Uh, my favourite slide from just before the financial crisis. So Citibank ran an advertising campaign, cost $100 million between 2005 and 2007. It was called Live Richly. You can see it at the bottom, sort of like sums it up. Opens a, open a cravings account. It was just one of my favourite slogans that they had. So that tells you you really are at the top of the Minsky and cycle when this stuff is going on. And of course, what happens, that's the bug that crashes the system. So that's bank leverage relative to GDP across all the countries that mattered in the financial crisis. That's the shortest version of that story that I can possibly tell. Now, why is this significant? What has this got to do with central banks? Well, unlike the 1980s, there was no hardware mod. There was no rewriting of the software. We simply issued a little software patch uh, called liquidity. And we told those central bankers who we had charged with price stability to create massive asset price instability in order to save the system. Exactly, as Katarina talked about yesterday, that's exactly what we did. And that's the balance sheets of the various large central banks in terms of what they had to do to keep the system going. But the problem is when you bail it rather than fail it, when you don't do a new hardware mod, when you don't rewrite the software, you're not addressing any of the underlying bugs. So that makes people rather angry, which was a book I did last year called Angrynomics, which basically makes the point that when central banks bail the systems by creating asset price inflation, asset inequality increases and compounds existing wage inequality. Austerity policy doubles down and makes that even worse. And then party systems, of course, as Jonathan Hopkins has shown in his recent book, fracture and fail as populism rises. This leads us to a kind of new post-regime policy mix that we're now in, which I think the British Conservative Party really do the best version of this, which is nationalism for the workers and asset protection for the wealthy. And that's essentially the very unstable post-settlement policy mix that we've got. Now, what's the consequences of this? Let's go back to the original question that I set here. If the regime has shifted, can we still ask central bank to do all the things that we asked them to do? Now, let's clarify what we mean by that. We asked them to do one thing, price stability. We didn't even ask them to do asset sales. We didn't ask for quantitative easing. All of this was the emergency response that became completely normalized, right? So we've expanded the toolkit, we've expanded the remit. Now we want to do loads of other things, such as green financing, green teltros, all this sort of stuff. And it was difficult enough to do this in the regime that it was designed to work in. If we actually are in a very different space, can we reasonably ask, even with the best of faith, for these institutions to work as advertised? To use another Britishism I, I really like, does it still do what it says on the tin? 
So here's a few things to think through. Let's start with long-term rates. I love this graph. It's from a 2018 paper. Uh, it started off with uh, Richard Skiller's history of interest rates back in about 2013. Japanese Cabinet Office also did some research into this, and I got a graph from them, which is equally amazing. But the bottom line is, interest rates have been falling for 700 years. And there's a weird thing about the 1970s. You can just about see it there in the, in the sort of the moving average, the seven-year moving average. Um, the, did we basically generalize from a tiny part of the sample? Are all of the lessons that we have taken regarding Nehru's and how the economy works, etc., really based upon a really out-of-sample sample at the end of the sample that implies that high real rates are normal? And the only reason you really have high real rates is because you have an inflation problem, right? So once you disinflate, you get this mean reversion back to trend. So until very recently, we were worried not about inflation, but about deflation, structural deflation, which, as we think about it, is the natural condition of capitalism, particularly when you have too many exporters pushing down global prices. So question number one, if the 70s was a blip, and then all the stuff that we learned from the 70s is an out-of-sample lesson, and we've mean reverted back to that, what is there for a central bank to do? What if the neutral real rate is structurally negative? And this inflationary blip that we're in just now is, as all inflations are, just another blip. So thought number one. Thought number two, until recently, we were talking about the death of the Phillips curve. It was horizontal. You could basically have any level of unemployment you wanted at a more or less constant rate of inflation. But then just when we began to think that, and began to accept that, and the central banks began to accept this, and they were rethinking their mandates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, boom, back comes the inflation. So is this the Arnie moment for central banks, right? I'll be back, right? So, you know, do we get back to the good old days of raising rates and monetary dominance simply because we have this inflation which has popped up, which is probably due mainly to supply side factors coming from COVID shutdowns, restarting the economy, some degree of fiscal stimulus. I really don't buy the overstimulus line uh, and uh, essentially, you know, war shocks. Now, if it is, here's an interesting question. How do expectations work with supply side inflation? Because the whole expectational model of embedded inflation expectations relies essentially on a kind of monetary theory of inflation. People expect prices to rise and it's being caused by too much money chasing too few goods in very simple terms. But if that's really not the case, right, if money's in there, it's, it's the great line of like, you know, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena and the response is shootings are always and everywhere a ballistic phenomena, right? It doesn't tell you about causation, but they were definitely involved. If we're in that same sort of world, then if you do have massive supply shocks uh, driving this inflation, if it's simply a shortage of goods rather than too much money, how should we think about expectations? And if you're thinking about expectations as the primary driver, I'm not sure how this works anymore. That gets much more complex. Can central banks withstand causing a deep recession? That's very different this time. You get to pull Volcker once. It's unexpected. You don't get to do that twice, and they know this. There's also something else that like, can never speak its name, which is the fact that the Fed is the global central bank. 97% of all moves of other central banks are basically checks to what the Fed does. Now, that's because it's the global reserve asset. Now, why is this important? Because when we saved the system by doing massive quantitative easing, you push down returns. When you push down returns, all that capital, because we globalized everything, goes flying off to places we call EMs. Those EMs struggle to cope with this because it pushes up their exchange rate and causes problems. And when one of the ways you do this is you absorb it into basically useless investment. So my favorite example of this is in Turkey, where there's a whole strew of hotels that takes this road out to Ankara that nobody will ever live in that have been built by Europeans borrowing dollars. There's all this capital misallocation. Now, you're going to keep that going because you're getting high real interest rates relative to the low interest rates here. If you really were a pool of Volcker, you would have the mother of all capital flights coming out of multiple areas of the globe all at once. Now, the Fed know this. They're not stupid. So they're probably not going to do it. But they keep being pressured to do more on interest rates, even though that's probably not an effective remedy for a supply shock. So again, this is getting very complex. 
Given all this, we keep reaching back to the 70s. Is this really even the right analogy? Because if that was part of a time-dependent macro regime that had its own very peculiar endogenous pathologies, which was inflation coming from very particular sources, that's not now, and it's not the same regime. So it can't be the right analogy. So to focus on that analogy is extremely dangerous in terms of policy. And if inflation is structurally higher but not accelerating, if this supply shock persists, but basically pushes us up to basically a base rate of 3 or 4%, should that require a response? Well, what exactly is the optimal response to that from the central bank? Because the assumption is it's temporary, that if you cause enough unemployment, you'll slow things down and you'll get back to that baseline rate. But if the neutral real rate, remember the long-term slide, is actually negative, what are you aiming for? Are you aiming for deflation? Don't know. A couple other ones. The bystander hypothesis. And a very strong co these are graphs from Andy Haldane. Um, strong correlation between independence and disinflation from 1980 to 1999. This is the case for CBI. CBI gets rid of inflation. Right? The effect massively weakens after 2000, particularly amongst the newer central bank that become much more independent. This is Juliet Johnson's story. Two things, or two ways you can look at this. The first one is credibility was established and low inflation became locked in. We do an expectation story. Number two, does it mean that the 70s were exceptional, that they were temporary drivers of inflation? And then once they wore off, we just mean reverted back to the low long term rates we showed you in the first slide. So, one way to think about this, Alan Blinder, of all folks, who's a very mainstream central banking type guy, but very interesting. He did a piece back in 1981 that I read recently, which is just brilliant about inflation. And he can, he's got the line, he says, uh, the, line, the best line in the article is, money was involved in this, but in no way was it causal. And he makes the following statement, that what caused the great inflation of the 70s were two things, uh, three things. The first one was two supply shocks in terms of food prices. Alongside of that, and connected to that, two oil shocks. And then a large incorporation, particularly in the United States, into super, already super tight labor markets of women and minorities without sufficient capital deepening to get a productivity gain that would pay for the incorporation. All, add all of that together, you just end up with an inflationary powder keg. Now, what he says is very, fast, very interesting. He says each of these things are temporary. They all wear off. But because basically they're not um, uh, normally distributed, and because they're not independent, they can carry, they compound each other. It looks like it's structural, but actually they all dissipate. By 1981, it's over. So was Volcker necessary, or was Volcker just plunging the knife into a corpse that was already half dead? And if it was, that raises a bigger question to the whole project of central banking. Were they essentially bystanders? Was the world disinflating anyway? We didn't need to do any of this stuff. Unless, of course, it's part of a very different project, which is just to restore the real value of capital. Then you have to think about it as a very different set of political institutions. Uh, right, this one. Lots of stuff here on this, greeting. Um, decarbonization is probably the most distributional thing we will ever attempt as societies. Handing this off to central banks who say officially we don't do distribution just strikes me as just a really bad way of going about this. Uh, yet that seems to be what we're doing, in part because they become the leader of last resort rather than the lender of last resort. Once you've given up on fiscal policy, once you've convinced yourself you can't, shouldn't, and if you do, you'll get into trouble, and you spend 40 years kneecapping the state, which is essentially what the neoliberal project has been, then somebody has to take the lead, and it's people like Andy Haldane, right? Because the actual political class are absolutely terrified of taking any type of chance with their electoral base. Why? Because nationalism for the workers, asset protection for everyone else leaves very little room for giant transformations that have large distributional consequences. Is price stability still relevant when you're hawking green teltros? <laughs> Probably not. Right? Um, when the whole concept of market neutrality when you try to do this also becomes kind of laughable. So they're trying to lead, but then they look at their own mandate and realize, actually, we can't do any of this stuff. So we're kind of like, we're like the worst form of ESG. We're really good at talking about this stuff without producing any type of results. 
More cynically, is this just another gimme to finance? Well, there's certainly some evidence that that could be the case. And, uh, you know, are deep decarbonisation and CBI even compatible? When you think about things like market neutrality, probably not. Yet, we're asking them to do this. Yeah, so are they being handed a poison chalice? Yeah, probably. All right, crypto. There's a crypto diagram. It's great. You just put crypto diagram into Google Images and all sorts of weird shit pops up. It's really amazing. Um, this is something, again, that uh, Catherine talked about yesterday. Um, is crypto over and should central banks care? Eh, the best story I've heard on this one is that if you are an elite in a country with incredibly unstable politics and property rights, the volatility of that is worse than the volatility of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has survived several crashes. All the other ones really don't have anything to add on top of that. So if you have a choice between fleeing with a ton of Bitcoin on a USB stick or hanging around in a place where they might kill you and seize your assets, you can see that there's still a role for Bitcoin. It's not going to go anywhere, right? That's there. It's part of the furniture. You're trading off one form of volatility for another. What does any of this have to do with central banks? Well, they cared because of Libra the notion that this private company could have 2.3 billion people trading in a currency that it issued scared the living crap out of them. And then when China figured out that, oh, if I can track every single piece of currency in real time through the hands of my citizens, I have the ultimate surveillance tool. They said, we need to get on this bandwagon. Now, this creates massive problems because... As Katrina mentioned yesterday, one of the consequences of this is if you set this up, you disintermediate the entire payment system. I don't think Jamie Dimon wants that to happen because that's where they make a lot of money. And they, when they're pressed on it themselves, again, as I said yesterday, say explicitly they don't want to do that. Then why do you want it? What are you going to do with this thing? What happens if they do? Does it create a problem in the sense that central bank digital currencies, like it or not, are massive surveillance technologies? And you might promise with all the best intent that you're not going to use it in that way, but you know the temptation is going to be far too great. And again, is this something that we should not have democratic oversight over and we should pass off to an independent and to a technocratic institution? Probably not. So again, along with the green stuff, I think the crypto stuff in the hand of central banks is much more problematic in the current moment than we like to admit. And then the last one, of course, is state legitimacy and capacity. It's not as if states have been having a great run of it lately. As I said earlier, in part because the neoliberal project has been to kneecap the state. And you denigrate it, defund it, tell everyone who works for it they're a loser, make the jobs unattractive, make the, anyone who's not in the private sector isn't really trying, all this sort of narrative nonsense. But it has the effect of running down capacity, the ability to actually take leadership and actually do something a bit different. Uh, in the US, the most extreme form of this, where I live, we're about to declare a fatwa on ESG and double down on carbon. So the last great carbon bonanza is about to happen. They've already started the campaign on this through the think tank network. It's called woke capitalism. Southern attorney generals have already sued several funds for not prioritizing and maximizing shareholder value because that's pushing them into ESG, which has a lower rate of return, et cetera, et cetera. Plus the entire ESG industry, if you read Tarek Fancy's fabulous blog that came out about 18 months ago, is a huge con job basically for the asset management industry. Then, yeah, this isn't looking so great either on this one. So if there is state action, you're going to get a state that's basically going to do exactly the wrong things in terms of what we should be doing in terms of a carbon future, whilst their central bank, Soto Voce, is trying to push in the other direction. In Europe, the Russian gas crisis could push the EU in the same way against decarbonisation. It's not clear which way this is going to work out. It might be great for renewables, but then again, it might not, and I'll say why in a moment. And when you have polarized politics with technocracy as a target, it's very hard to talk about state capacity being transformative if no one trusts the state, which again, undermining that sense of trust has been a core part of the neoliberal project. So what does this lead to? I think this leads to CBI and a disrupted geopolitics. This is a really, really important diagram. What it shows is all the stuff that the EU needs to do the green transition. 
And while we focus on mining and supply and things like if we can get better cathode technology, you can use a lower grade of lithium, which means that all of Portugal becomes a lithium mine, so we don't have to worry about supply from these places. The real trick is in refinement. And if you have a look at the right-hand side there on processing, it all happens in China. And given EU environmental laws, you're never going to do that stuff here. So that means that if the EU wants to continue down a decarbonisation route, it's going to have to be really, really nice to China. There's no other way around us. So you've got a world in which the E-Americans are about to aggressively turn away from decarbonisation. And the EU and China are serious about it. But the EU is critically dependent on China for two things. Number one, export-led growth. But secondly, increasingly, green tech refinement and green tech imports for the transition. And then you've got the rest of the world deprived for funding for the transition because we won't cough up to the people who are most effective. We acknowledge moral responsibility, but will not actually pay for it. And at the same time, those, 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 the rest of the world is increasingly dependent on expensive imports for both energy and food because of the way that we're mishandling the transition. So if you add all that together, that's not a central bank problem. But we've left them as the governors of last resort. We asked them to do all these things because we have people like Boris in charge. And we have no faith in them either. So we're asking the leader of last resort to do things that would have been difficult in the best of times. And in the best of times, they probably didn't achieve a lot of the things that they thought they did through their own actions. They may have been bystanders in many ways. And now we're going to ask those same institutions to do all that and more. It's not going to work out, is it? I'll leave it there. Starting the day on a happy note. Hmm. Okay. We'll start with the Q&A now. Yeah. Jens, go straight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot for this. Uh, so I agree with a very, very large part of everything you said, yet I also wrote a proposal for green TLTROs. So there must be something we, we disagree on, right? Awesome. Uh, but um, so I guess I would first say the timing you took for the neoliberal era strikes me as too optimistic. So you say the neoliberal era ends in 2008. Why not say it ends in 2020? And then I yeah. wonder if given, I think, the, the, the taxonomy of macroeconomic regimes you give, we could actually be much more optimistic to say, like, yes, we had this period of the deflationary block narrowly focused on stability of a financial system, not taking into account the social and environmental aspects, but actually we're moving back to a very different uh, macroeconomic regime. We still have the old hardware, but the software is very quickly changing, and we need to push that, that uh, forward. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder what, what is the role of central banks in this at the moment, right? So I guess... The, 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 I think the good version of, of central banks is uh, supporting existing climate policies. So the Green Teal TRO proposal is that you align bank lending mm -hmm. with existing democratic decisions on how you want to allocate capital in the economy. And um, I guess if that's the, the, the vision, then I, I guess the uh, most of the opposition to that has been mobilized with this woke uh, ESG frame as it being a, an undemocratic imposition mm -hmm. of green objectives that haven't been properly democratically achieved. And I think that that's broadly where, where a lot of, lot of the action is. But, and maybe this is a further point, and, and I mean, your, your historical work also brings out how, how messy this transition mm -hmm. around the 1980s was. And I think, it, look, we, we do not know if we move to this different regime, but I guess if we are now in the process of moving to that new regime, this is exactly how messy that process should be looking, right? So it should be looking like some central bank actors are doing things, states are, are doing not enough because they, they lack the state capacity. And uh, I think in general, the pro project of pushing central banks to do more greening, 
to accommodate a, a movement in that direction. That that is, I think, part of how that that transition should be working. And of course, there there is a larger role for the democratic process. But in in an optimistic uh, mm -hmm. version of the world, the uh, green tilt arrows are just you know one one step in a very messy dialectical ideological shift. But I, I would be much more optimistic about the the future yeah. uh, trajectory that that this could push towards. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't disagree with any of that, and I would hope that you're right. I think that my pessimism comes from the fact that I live in the United States, and it's it's bleak. <laughs> it's really bleak. Um, I also do wonder about the ability of Europe to pull this off, given its relationship with China and the critical dependence on tungsten and on beryllium and a whole bunch of stuff that you're never going to make or refine here. So there has to be an accommodation with that, with which is an increasingly sort of problematic relationship in many ways. So I think this extends beyond central banks. Um, in terms of the timing of the regime, yeah, I, I date it in a way in the sense, the end of it in a way in the sense that, you know, the, the morbid symptoms persist and the corpse is still there. We're, 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 me we're moving it to something else or it could just be breakdown. I mean, we don't know. I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, Helen Thompson's thesis in a sense, right? That this is disorder. There's no new equilibrium that's coming up. And again, I, I think that your story is as plausible as mine or anybody else's that, you know, we can get through this and this is exactly the messiness that we would expect to see given the challenges that we face. And I think I would just say, I really, I really hope you're right. I really hope you're right. I hope that there is a better equilibrium to reach for. And I think that there is. But whether we can get there when we've weakened the capacity of states so much and undermined faith in the ability of states so much the you know incredibly sensible ideas like you know the the US version of the Green New Deal, I mean it's it's a pretty straightforward sort of like we'll you know swap assets, bail out communities, etc. There's zero trust to go down that route. I mean a very simple way of thinking about American politics. I did this in a piece in uh, Foreign Policy two years ago. You start in Alaska, go down through the Dakotas, go through uh, Oklahoma, hit East Texas, hang a left. Uh, say hi to Louisiana, spin round, come out to West Virginia. They're the most Republican parts of the United States. They're all carbon asset states. That's what they do. It's the exploration, exploitation, transformation of carbon and its derivatives. And they look at the Green New Deal as a mortal threat to their very existence. And they have zero trust in the Democrats' ability to, tr to make this whole because they lived through deindustrialization and the China shock and everything that the Democrats authored. So they have absolutely no reason to trust them. And that's that type of toxic politics that I worry about. That's not Europe, and that's not the European Green New Deal. So yes, there is much more hope here. So my pacifism is, you know, colored by where I sit. Next question. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Uh, you know that I agree with you about a lot of this, but he, m my question is sort of follows off of Jens's, which is, you know, your driving question, right? Can, are we asking too much of central banks? And also, Pavlos is sort of set up for the conference, right? Are they omnipotent? Or are they sort of impotent? It strikes me as holding given something that we shouldn't be holding given, right? So, like, what are we talking about central banks here as currently constituted? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about uh, the possibilities of monetary policy writ large as historically, you know, employed or even as we could conceive of employing them? And how much of that should we be holding given when we're facing sort of the, the, the issues that we're facing? And so, you know... One way to respond is to say, yeah, we definitely shouldn't be having central banks as currently constituted doing green policy. Like that, that's obviously going to fail. And insofar as it succeeds, it's going to be green policy for the finance system, right? right. Um, but should we be telling them to do things differently? Should we be reconstituting monetary policy? And and one just little, little sort of small example, I think that came out that relates a lot to what you were saying at the end is, of course right at the, at the woke capitalism stuff, right? Right at the end of the Trump administration, the OCC passed a rule saying that banks were discriminating mm -hmm. uh, improperly when they were not lending or not investing in, you know, 
arms dealers and certain, you know, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> certain yeah. carbon, you know, b based uh, assets. And so, and they said, you can't do that. You have to use sort of predetermined quantitative metrics that are profit maximizing. And that's the only way you're allowed to operate. Everything else is discrimination. The Biden administration paused the rule, but, you know, shouldn't we just be like, saying discrimination is actually how this all works and we need to be deciding together how we're gonna discriminate and then moving from there. I mean, isn't that the hopeful story? And is your reaction to that just like, that's just politically infeasible and it'll never happen? Well, again, it depends where, right? So, I mean, let's think of one of the most sort of successful decarbonizations in, that we have is, believe it or not, you all know this, most people don't, the United Kingdom, uh, in part because it deindustrialized. <laughs> That's, that's what drove most of the effect. But then it opened up a space to become sort of, you know, very big in wind and do this sort of stuff. And I think that, like, polities that have some degree of social cohesion and stability can certainly do this. Again, I live in one that simply doesn't have this, at least at this moment in time. So, you know, again, I think that the Fed is exemplary of this, you know, are they incredibly powerful or are they powerless question? And it's, it really is a Rorschach test, right? Because on the one hand, yes, you know, we do the global reserve asset, Everybody else has to earn what we print, you know, run, run the story. Very powerful, right? They're terrified of Congress opening up the 1913 Act and poking around in what they do. They will never admit that they're the global central bank in public. They'll never say this sort of stuff. So there's a way in which that power is incredibly constrained at the same time. So I think that, like, your dilemma is completely correctly that we we have to think of these things as being something that they're not in order to change them into what we need them to be, if that makes sense. But they themselves are not willing to do that. And then the sort of, if you will, the political capital on the other side, just leadership. And then when you do have leadership, as Biden tried to show, right, at the beginning of uh, his term, you've got veto points. You have systems that have veto points and then they just, you know, the mansion problem. So, again, I'm far more bullish and hopeful on Europe being able to pull this off, albeit at the cost of a compromise with China. See how, we'll see what that price is. But that I can see happening, right? The US, to me, is basically, it's a frat boy keg party, and it's six in the morning, and they've just found the last two kegs of beer, and they're going to go for it. And the hangover from that two electoral cycles from now is that's this. I've always been very sort of you know bullish on the the U.S. hegemony question, right? You know, it's not disappearing anytime soon. The dollar is superordinate. This is what's going to do it, and this is ultimately what's going to do it in in about a decade. Um, my name is Ulash. Thank you, Mark, for this really brilliant presentation. You touched upon so many and you brought together so many questions which are a topic of this conference also, and I really enjoyed it. I myself also worked on central bank independence, and I asked myself after hearing your presentation whether this concept of CBI can go on. Because uh, just while I watched the slides, if the role of China is becoming more and more important, then what would be the reaction from, let's say, from Europe? It's it become clear with Russia now that they will not go with this laissez-faire thing. Mm -hmm. And um, leaving or setting the central bank independent would mean, since central bank independence is also part of the neoliberal paradigm, just let the markets do and we'll observe and so on. But I think that after we saw fiscal dominance and monetary dominance, the next period will be, I don't know, maybe strategic dominance. They need to bring monetary policy in coordination with their investment policy to somehow adapt to this situation. Mm -hmm. But because the private investment will not do this. That's what I think. So I think we really, as some colleagues also observed, that it's, it's an end of this depolitization of monetary policy. We are in the area of repolitization and central bank independence, I think it's really uh, over, but it will survive, of course, its core maybe, because they need to coordinate all this. Um, I think you showed very well, decarbonization is not only about rescuing the planet, because it's uh, to adapt to this uh, dependence also with China. And you, you showed it very well. So yeah. yeah, thanks again for your really nice contribution.
And just as a comment on that, I mean, you know, you're going to talk to Paul Tucker tomorrow, and you know, I sent Paul my slides, and he said, so with just one question, do you, do you think CBI is over or not, and do you think that's a good thing or not? And more or less, that's what he said. And I said, I honestly don't know. I don't know, because do I think the operational control of interest rates in the hands of a dis, you know, non-politicized actors uh, is a good thing? Well, it depends on what the alternative is. Now, the alternative is Boris and the current clowns that have been running Britain for the past 10 years. Actually, yeah, I'd bring back Eddie George any time, right? But that shouldn't be the default for that. In a sense, there are bigger things that we need to do, and green teltros and all the rest of it implies obviously, the, the political control of interest rates for lending, for strategic purposes, has to come forward. But, you know, it's the old problem with functionalist explanations. Just because there's a need doesn't mean the solution is going to show up. So, you know, that's the bit where I would give a little bit of pause on it. So, I'm also not as down on the private sector. I think the private sector actors are basically profit-led, Profits can be had in various different ways, depending on how you, how you shape where profitability can be made. And also, I mean, just anecdota, ane anecdotally, um, I did consulting for, um, uh, let's say, I can't remember if the NDA that allows me to say this, for a very big company that moves large quantities of earth around, right? And I asked the CEO why they gave a crap about doing all this green stuff. And he says, because my daughter hates me. And those sort of little micro-social pressures also apply to investors. And those things can be weaponized and used very productively. So I think that's also an important part of the mix. Private sector balance sheet is actually, I mean, if you take the point about sovereignty seriously in terms of currency, right? Most states are non-sovereign. Huge amounts of states have original sin problems. If that is defined as borrowing in a currency, you don't print, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the balance sheet capacity, at least through a standard bond market way of thinking, uh, of the seven or eight real sovereigns in the world, the actual private sector asset balance sheet is about 10x that. So to, to basically say this has to be the state and we can't do anything without the center is taking 90% of the solution off the table. So I, I think they have to talk to each other somehow. Yeah. That's the real project. I think the quote was from the German CEO uh, from Daimler Benz, I remember, with the daughter. No, this was mine. It was a totally different one. It was not, it was not Daimler Benz. Same. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. No, I think this is very common. I think this is actually really important. Okay, uh, I'm going to take advantage of holding the mic, and I'm going to put a question there, and then I'll pass it on to the next. Um, about the question of central bank independence and whether it's coming or dying or, or leaving or whatever, I want, to, I want to add a little historical perspective, because there's this story, of course, that central bank independence is something that kind of arises yeah. at the end of the 70s, time consistency, the question of inflation, right. the inherent inflationary tendency of politicians, et cetera, et cetera, and then it becomes widespread in the 90s. And that's the story that explains CBI in that context. But at the same time, there's an equally strong narrative, and I think you mentioned that as well, that it wasn't central banks that actually achieved low inflation. It's more the idea that you have a whole political class that is committed to never, ever pursuing such policies. And as a consequence, you know, central banks are being given the credit for something that it was basically a political choice yeah. of everyone involved. But there's a further story. If central bank independence is under, like, conceptualized as the institutional form that comes to replace the end of the gold standard. Because the, the, the origins, the historical origins of the central bank are in the 1920s, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where things start. And it's a way of saying, okay, if you have fiat money and mass democracy, how do you insulate monetary policy from social pressures? Right. And the response is central bank independence. In that context, that has not changed. Yeah. Whether low inflation or high inflation, disinflation doesn't matter. If that is the origin of central bank independence, that has not changed for the last 100 years, and I don't see it changing. So the idea that central bank independence might be yeah. at its no, end, I, think I, would, it, I would question that. Um, this is exactly what uh, Katrina was talking about yesterday. Right? I mean, basically, the, the, if you will, the main sort of institutional building blocks of capitalism are pre-democratic and basically anti-democratic. Now, you can put a democratic wrapper around that, but it doesn't change the expropriation process through law and legal codes and all the rest of it. So, yes, you have a problem, mass democracy, fiat money, how, how do you solve that? So this is Jamie Martin's new book, talks about this, right? This is um, uh, Clara, 
Maya? Uh, she's at the new school. Yes, exactly. This is her new book, basically, on sort of how Italian economists in the 20s invented austerity as a way of disciplining the workers, which is the political project that goes along with us. Um, it's really weird. 25 years ago, I taught a class with David Harvey. And I was at that point probably the, the, the most Marxist I ever was. But when you teach a class with David, you realize you're not really a Marxist. He's really a Marxist. I was just pretending. Um, and I sort of moved away from that way of thinking. I started to write about ideas and all this sort of stuff around social construction, whatever. And I've been through various intellectual permutations. Um, I'm basically coming back to where I started, which is that there is a basic political problem, which is that money and all of its correlates and profit is an anti-democratic project, that uh, expropriation exploitation is built into the system, and that ultimately the restoration of profit against the labor share is the core conflict. That's it. So I wouldn't disagree with any of that at all. And, but that just compli I mean, I don't know what to do with that then, right? Because if it's a constant, it can't be a good explanation. Constants can't explain variation. And we have variation. So there's got to be something else going on there. I'm uh, Marijn van der Sluis. I'm a constitutional lawyer working on economic topics um, such as monetary integration and now climate law. And one of the things that you touch upon a few times when it's regarding US veto powers, about Boris, about the EU being reliant on China, I, I, I see constitutional topics about how to design democracy. And one of the things that I find a bit striking also in the green debates is the absence of a thorough discussion on green democracy. What does it require? What does it mean to have a green democracy? Because if you have a bit of faith, if you say you have a bit of faith in the EU at the moment, what it's doing with the Green Deal, the Green Deal is also playing on some of the worst tendencies of the European Union. It's over-reliance on technocrats. It's <laughs> setting aside democracy. So where does, what does a green democracy look like? based on the political economy that you sketch. What, is it, what does it require of us? And I think the, the model that I'm asking for is, is a bit the social democracy. Which institutions do we need? Which hardware do we need? Where do we need to make these climate choices that are political, that are democratic, but that don't produce Boris Johnson? Yeah. Is one way to think about this is perhaps is if depoliticizing, if technocratic rule is essentially a depoliticizing project, have we depoliticized everything to the point that we can no longer have a productive politics? That becomes, if you will, the sort of the base reflex of technocratic rule, plus complexity, plus expertise, plus all these sorts of things. And you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for that type of thing. Um, what we've just seen in the United States with the most recent Supreme Court ruling over the EPA is what happens when a conception of democracy, albeit enforced by a totally anti-democratic institution, says that you just can't do technocracy. And that could be equally, if not worse. So there is a question of balance in this. But, you know, it's, again, it's uh, as I asked Katharina yesterday, you know, it, it is, does the sentence, you know, democratizing finance actually contain any information or is it just an empty statement? And perhaps it is an empty statement. Green democracy may, and this deeply worries me, be exactly the same thing, right? So if I look at the work that Ben has done with Dana, right, you have three choices. You have markets, which won't do it. You have nudges, which won't do it. And you have a big green state. Big state doesn't necessarily say democracy to me. Right? And in fact, if you want to see the most successful example of how to do this stuff, it's China. Right? So last year, China installed more wind than the rest of the world has, because they can. Right? And in a few years' time, they'll say, diesel engines, done, next Tuesday. And everyone will go, OK, because that's the way you do things. But it's not at all democratic. And that's why I think that if there is, and I think there is, this real dependence that the EU's transition is going to have on China, that's a very problematic relationship for a bunch of democracies to have. So then we'll start to do exceptional politics, and those exceptions will become normalized. 
and then there'll be more state and less democracy. So the, the, the way to avoid that is to become much more politically active, democratically active. But I also think it means different forms of politics, maybe many publics, maybe randomly drawn representative assemblies alongside of parliaments, right? actually giving people voice and taking that voice seriously and constitutionally mandating those types of forums may be a way to energize some form of democratic input into these things, because the tendencies are pulling in very anti-democratic directions, even when we're trying to do the right thing. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm Nathan Marcus, I'm an economic historian. I was intrigued by uh, um, your suggestion that um, at the time of the Volcker shock, the world might have already been in a deflationary period. And I didn't read the Binder article, so I was wondering whether that's uh, your argument, uh, your, your suggestion or Binder's suggestion, and also how that, um, how you then explain that prices were still rising at the time of the Volcker shock. How would that have looked like? Uh, how do you, I don't know any high mm -hmm. inflation regime that you exit without a shock, basically. I mean, right. It doesn't just turn around. So it's a question of what the decay function is relative to what the expectations function is. So um, if you have a supply shock and the supply shock filters through an industrial, like oil, and it filters through an industrial economy, uh, that's going to massively affect producer prices right across a whole host of industries. So you're going to have this whole price rise. When you do this, you notice there's a huge supply shock in 2006 to oil prices. There was no inflation showed up at all. Right? So the supply shock itself is determinant upon the type of economy that it hits into. When you hit a much more post-industrial economy, it's very different. Right? Although this time it seems to have shown, showed up again. Um, that's my extrapolation of Binder's argument. He's not making that argument, right? number one. Uh, but I think that sort of most inflationary regimes are not supply shock driven. And the 70s was a global supply shock that affected everybody that dissipated pretty much by about 1983, at least across the OECD countries. If you're thinking particularly of southern cone countries, with Argentina being the poster child of this stuff, so much of that comes basically from the inability to... The short version of the story, as I'd tell it, is that the, the Peronis coalition in the 50 can't squeeze labor the same way the East Asians can in order to produce the surplus to do ISI. So you borrow. And when, as long as you're borrowing at a negative real rate, it's a great idea. When you get a Volcker shock, you get positive real rates, you get absolute capital destruction, which was the 1980s. And then because you can never discharge that debt, you keep rolling it over, you end up with permanent currency insecurity and high inflation coming through the import channel. So you can have a, 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 a political economic regime that is just basically inflation bound. Right? That's not the shock story. But I would suggest that at least for the sort of the OECD countries of the, the great inflation period, it was pretty much over by 83. And if you look at the ramp up in prices, the ramp up in prices really begins to kick in. It ebbs and flows. The US stuff's interesting. I mean, basically 69, 70, 71. Then there's a turn around 72, 73. Uh, there is evidence that the Nixon price controls actually worked. And what happened was they made them voluntary. And when they made them voluntary, they just blew through. So there was a way in which the policy response engendered an even bigger endogenous side to what was an external shock. So, you know, I just, I, I, I can, that's how I make sense of it. I don't know if that's answering your question or if that's making sense to you, but that's how I make sense of that period. But it is an interesting counterfactual, right? I mean, ultimately, did we need Volcker? Yeah. So I, I I'm not convinced. I'm just not convinced. But I don't know, because it's a counterfactual. Thank you a lot, Mark. Here. Oh, Joshua. sorry. Hi. <laughs> Jake, sorry. Um, thank you a lot for your talk and um, for your insights. And I would like to push you a little bit in another direction. I think the software analogy you bring in is problematic. Um, the reason is that um, I think, well, in your story, I mean, of course, it was a provocation, but in your story, there was uh, software running until the 17th, and we had inflation, computer crashed, mm -hmm. reinstallment, little, little software patch. Hardware mod. It. Right. Yeah. And I would say that's wrong. It was not inflation that crashed, that crashed Fordism. It was inflation what was rather uh, the opportunity then to bring forward new policies that were already in place, that were already working. I mean, 
Bretton Woods would crashed before we had inflation. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had the Big Bang by uh, Thatcher and Reagan. That was at the same time. So I would say no, it wasn't inflation that crashed the system. Yeah, it was rather struggles that were already around, trying to look for opportunities to, yes, bring it, bring forward a new system. So to crash Fordism, of course. Yeah, and I would say so. Um, it is necessary to bring in the notion of political struggles, which I kind of miss a little bit in your story. So um, to understand Fordism as a historical compromise mm -hmm. between capital and labor, that was then, of course, derailed. Yeah? But it was not inflation. It was because of different political struggles, because of interests, because of strategies. Yeah? So then, of course, Fordism was replaced by something, and the kind of new historical sort of compromise that arised, and what we are learning from regulation theories then, that no, you're not gaining more income, but you get cre uh, um, um, credit, yeah? Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can go on with your life, but it's, it's a replacement, mm -hmm. yeah? So, do we have, should we have a fate in the state? Of course not, yeah? Should we have a fate in the market? Much less, even. But that's not the point, we're not doomed. That's, I think that's, it's more to shift our analysis, not to the big stories, mm -hmm. but to look at the different struggles. And I think what Katarina brought in yesterday is super important. Don't think of, here's the market, here's the state, yeah, and there are clear-cut borders. There's a permanent shift, a permanent replacement, and not because of something natural, but because of struggles, because of vested interests, yeah. That's, that's the point, I think. And, and if you look then with this kind of view on the state, it's not like, we have bad leaders, partly yes, of course, yeah? But the state is the outcome of political struggles. So it's neither bad or good, but it's not there as, uh, just to be there, but mm -hmm. it's changeable. And I think it's more difficult, but the same is uh, true for the central banks. It's not central banks good or bad. Do we have a faith in central banks in general? Of course not. Do we think we can change something? Maybe a little bit. And people in the room are working in this direction, believing it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's even harder because there's this independence. Yeah? But it's not that either or, and that's problematic. So what I would like to push you a little bit is to think more in terms of shifting borders. Yeah? I mean, to learning from Katarina Pistor yesterday, in terms of law, and I was not aware of that, this possibility of shifting the law step by step, yeah? super interesting. Yeah. But the same is true, of course, then for the other rules yeah? mm -hmm. and, 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 and for the, all the compromises we have. So I would like to push you a little bit more in, to keeping in your analysis the notion of um, struggle and interest and take these struggles serious, more seriously. I think that's entirely fair. Um, I think intellectually over time, you, you, know, you, you change. I, I've become more macro, more structuralist, and there's a cost. There's a cost to doing that. 10, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I would have started with political struggle. But um, let me give you two versions of Fordism. So one is a standard Kalekian story whereby it may be political struggle, but it's a political struggle about profits. I and mean, inflation is essentially a profit tax. It's a tax on future expected returns. If inflation rises to 10% and my expected rate of return over five years is 5%, I've got a negative five real why would I invest? I'll, I'll go on a capital strike. So I think that even if you say inflation wasn't the bug, I would say that it was the thing that caused the struggle. Because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't worry about the profit share. You wouldn't worry about the fact that the all-time labor share hits 1973 as this high point. So I think the political struggle is engendered by these structural factors. But I'll do another version of Fordism, which completely does it a different way. And the thing is, the problem with analysis of at this level of these very big things is there are multiple overlapping stories which could possibly be true. So here's one that I get from Her Herman Schwartz about this one. So that's a standard sort of breakdown of Fordism story from the domestic level. Let's do an international one. Uh, by 1971, Bretton Woods, push it out, just do a simple production story. You've developed capacity for exports again in Germany. You've got it again in Japan. Um, Fordism rests upon a compromise between labor and capital is based upon stable inputs. So long as the United States is able to export capital and export what it needs to other countries that are buying its stuff, the system is stable and those price inputs can be guaranteed. And that's what the whole corporatist bargain is about. 
once everybody starts making cars and flooding the market, there's only so many cars that can be absorbed before those prices have to shift. So that shift in relative prices, once Toyota shows up, once BMW shows up, really affects the entire market for cars worldwide. Do that through multiple iterations across multiple industries, and the this compromise falls apart because there's no way to guarantee the stable inputs. That, to me, strikes me as a plausible story as well. I don't see what's wrong with that story, but it's one where there is no political struggle. It is basically a fallacy of composition problem at a system level. There are always political struggles. Are they the things that we should be focused on? Maybe. Sometimes, yes. In terms of getting to a better future, it's all we've got. I absolutely 100% agree with that. But I think the point of analysis is sometimes to take a different view from that that tells us that maybe the action is over in a different place from the one that we're usually used to looking at. That may be wrong, but it's a useful exercise. Can I maybe jump in and, and just exactly on this point? Because now I'm a bit confused, because on the one hand we're saying, you know, depoliticization has created this kind of technocratic understanding of everything, and we, this is something we need to fight back against and at the same time saying maybe political struggles is not the place we should be focusing on? Well, not in terms of, of political change and actually trying to achieve things, but I'm simply saying, you know, look, Nick and I are doing... It's Nick, wasn't it? That's right. We're writing a book on inflation, and it's called A Guide for Users and Losers. And we're starting off with the following premise. There is no true story about inflation. There just isn't. We still don't agree what caused the Spanish inflation, right? Uh, here in this country, oh my God, I mean, the whole thing about the 1920s and the wheelbarrow full of money, the first authoritative history of the great inflation in Germany was written in 1969. Until that time, it was all anecdata. It was all about grandma telling stories of what happened back in the day. So we construct retrospectively what become our authoritative treaties and understandings, and they're all politically constructed and contested. So given this, the project that we have in the book is to simply say, here are these different narratives. Whoever gets to impose that narrative as the one that wins creates a series of winners and a series of losers. So let's be honest about what that distributional politics is. That's a purely analytic exercise, which has very serious political consequences, because it suggests that a lot of our analytic apparatus is just class politics by other means. And I think that that is a defensible claim. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that our analytic projects basically, therefore, are disconnected from politics or are orthogonal to politics. They're just different at different points. Right? Taking Herman's story of the collapse of Fordism seriously makes me rethink what I think. And if you're not rethinking what you're thinking, you're not thinking. So, you know, that's the point of it. Not everything is tied up in political struggle. Estatichna, as the Russians would say. Enough? Oh, yeah, no, there's over Sorry, there. Yeah. Although the German genug is simpler. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this uh, brilliant presentation. I, I, I will put it uh, bluntly. Uh, uh, should, uh, should, we central, uh, should central banks respond to uh, supply shock inflation? Because for, from your talk, uh, yeah. I think the, there is an implicit uh, normative statement which uh, going back to the comparison with the 70s, uh, I have a rather gloomy picture of central banks that it, at best they, they are all very often uh, dangerous and at best useless. So uh, what should we do uh, when there is a supply shock? Because from your talk it seems that you should simply... Uh, Ride it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why maybe... Yeah. There is something at stake, yeah, thanks. So, I, I, no, thank you for the provocation. I'm not actually that down on central banks. I just, the point of doing this as a thinking exercise is to, you know, push the boundaries and see where the space is. And you have to confront things like 
lots of places that didn't have a high degree of CBI also disinflated in the 1980s. So what's going on with that, right? So it's not a sort of like, I hate central banks. That, that's really not the case. It's a question of, are they fit for purpose? And one of the ways you figure that out is by figuring out if they really did the stuff that they claim or people claim for them. And there's some degree that maybe that wasn't the case. So that's the first point. In terms of responding to supply shocks, um, I actually think it would be much... Let's think about what we're doing, right? This is, this is the key. Um, the Bank of England basically said to British workers, don't ask for pay increases. So in other words, we need to have either a recession or unemployment or falling living standards to solve this problem. Now, profitability of firms has been going up for the past two years and is incredibly high, particularly in highly concentrated industries, particularly in the United States. So The Guardian did an analysis recently for average rate of profit increase over the past 18 months has been 49%. And our firms are earning way, way more than that, super profits. Now, whether they are actually the cause of inflation, whether adding on or what, let's just leave that, right? They're making super profits, and the solution is we're going to raise interest rates. When you raise interest rates, the people who are at the bottom end of the income distribution, who have borrowed the most, pay the most for credit. So you're going to make them poorer and their lives more precarious, and you're going to help them by making their credit more expensive. So you're just punishing them. There's nothing else going on. There's another way we could do this. You could have an exorbitant profit tax, and you could rebate that profit straight to the people who are the, perhaps the bottom 30% of the income distribution. But we will never do that because profits are sacrosanct. Right? So there are always other ways of doing this. The political struggle in this case is why are we unable to think that? So it's not that I would say central banks are bad because central banks have got two tools. Raise and lower the cost of money, buy and sell assets. That's pretty much it. There's a supply shock. We have an inflation problem. We're politicians. We don't know shit. We don't think we can do anything. Let's hand it over to the central banks. What do you think they're going to do? Buying and selling assets ain't going to do anything about that. That's already proven counterproductive. So they're going to have to raise the price of money. And they, they do. They know there's a huge distributional consequence here, which the weakest in society were the ones that will bear, bear the burden of it. Meanwhile, for me, I mean, just think about how lunatic this is, right? Um, I just love, it's, a, it's an MMT line, but I, but I love it. Um, basically, raising interest rates is UBI for people with savings deposits. If I've got 100,000 sitting in a savings deposit and you push interest rates up to 10%, what happens after a year? I get free money. Meanwhile, somebody who doesn't have that is actually being taxed effectively and being asked to suffer unemployment. So that's a huge distributional thing that's happening to a supposedly non-distributional institution. I think there are just different ways we should be thinking about this problem. Let's have uh, two more questions and then wrap it up. Um, hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm having a bit of trouble trying to wrap up um, my general uh, question here. Um, but I think I want to push a little bit about this uh, political struggle that you are kind of... Um, um, Dancing not... around? Yeah, a bit. Um, because, I mean, when we think about uh, economic ideas or how it changed uh, during the... Uh, after 2008, that's when your regime change stopped, um, we had this questioning because economic theory uh, had in mind that if you had... Price stability was the same thing as output stability. So this divine coincidence was in place. Right. And that was kind of challenged during the crisis. And we had all rethinking in economics. And maybe we should have extra policy tools. So well, let's give macroprudential policies to central banking for emerging markets. OK, let them manage the exchange rate and do some other things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it seems that there was room for a kind of a regime change in terms of giving in another target for this, this type of regime. But it didn't happen. Right. Uh, so we didn't have a regime change. And what is the explanation for that? So for me, uh, for, for my understanding, it was related to political struggles. Uh, but if it's not, then what it is? So these two things don't need to be mutually exclusive. The, I think the worst tendency in the social sciences is for one thing to be true, therefore other things need to be false. So I think you can have a simultaneous truth here. 
uh, absolutely, there was a failure of politics to imagine a possible different set of targets in a different future. There was an inability to mobilise a sufficient electoral coalition to make this happen. There was the interference of the billionaire class and the poisoning of the well and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely, 100%. But there was also the fact that for the past 30 years, we'd said, over to you, Eddie George. Like, we don't do this. If you go back to the mid-2000s and look at what Labour MPs were actually doing at the tail end of the Blair administration, they spent their time on Twitter saying that paedophilia is bad. No shit, Sherlock, right? What exactly are you doing in terms of legislation? What are you doing in terms of, like, preparing us for a carbon transition? What are you actually doing in terms of building coal? Nothing. There was nothing. Politics was dead. We had delegated politics to central banks. And because we were living in a period of great moderation and output volatility, etc., seemed to be going well. So it was a great gig. I had all this power, but no responsibility. Then, then the whole thing blows up. We have no idea what to do. We turn to the same governors, the, 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 the regulators and, and rulers of last resort, and say, fix this, please. They use the tools that they've got. They're not into paradigm shifts. That's not part of the mandate. So you can simultaneously have the consequences of over-relying on a set of technocratic institutions and the failure of politics. In fact, the two of them would go together. One enables the other. So I don't see these as orthogonal. I think both of them can be true. That's why efficient explanations are a terrible idea. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Super proactive, very many thoughts. And one of the things I wanted to ask you a bit more about is, so I completely agree with you that, you know, the dollar is the global reserve currency, Fed is World Central Bank. But I just want, and then you touched upon quickly, well, is, and I'm also want somebody who believes this is not going to end anytime soon, but then you made this comment, well, maybe in about 10, 10 years. years. Exactly. And so I, I really can't conceptualize how that would happen. Uh -huh. So I just wanted to put, ask you a little bit, how do you sure. see this uh, unfolding. And then the second question I want to ask you, um, I mean, you talked a lot about, you know, developed countries in China, but we haven't really talked about developing countries, right? And they're going to suffer the brunt of climate change. So I just wanted to ask you, but what do you see as the pressures coming from the future suffering in those countries, right? At some point, this is going to reach our shores, also yeah. our central banks. How do you think they can adapt or deal with this? Or how do you th see this playing out? I'll take the first one, the last one first, right? They're both great, great issues and, and super important. Um, one of the reasons that China is taking climate change so seriously is the last IPCC report basically did estimates for what they call wet bulb temperatures in particular regions of the world. And if we just keep going exactly in the business as usual scenario, then the northern Chinese cities will have wet bulb temperatures and they won't be able to cool them because they'll be burning so much colder on the air conditioners. It's just a, a, a disaster loop. And they know this and they have to break it. And that's why they're serious about doing something about it. That's not going to help North India. That's not going to help Transcaucasia. That's not going to par help parts of the Maghreb. So the migration pressures that Europe finds itself in at the moment uh, are not even the Vorspiese. These are going to be huge, and that's just baked into the cake. So that's the one that, you know, if you want a reason to do as much as possible, that, that's your reason, go for it, right? In terms of the sort of the, the, the end of the dollar type thing, uh, it's not so much the end of the dollar. There are serious structural factors that keep it in place. The number one being China can't internationalize its currency, because if it does, its entire capitalist class will leave. <laughs> they don't want to be there. There's a reason that like Vancouver house prices are what they are and why those vacancies are there. And they tried this in 2015-16 and basically nearly a trillion left the country. So that's not happening. So if you can't internationalize your currency, you can't come there. So you could have some kind of commodity back thing or gold back thing for exchanges between Russia and China. That's not, not really challenging it. I mean it in the following sense. What are the only industries that are going to matter going forward? they're going to be basically adaptation technologies. If you spend the next 10 years basically going on the last great carbon binge and pretending that nothing else is, that all this is all crap and woke capitalism, China and Europe are going to continue pace. They're going to develop all these industries. That's the only thing that's going to matter. 
And 10 years from now, when the United States kindly finally sobers up from the great carbon binge after two electoral cycles, they're going to have to just buy all that stuff from everyone else because they will have no capacity to produce their own at scale. And the fact that they already sent most of the productive plant and equipment away in the first place doesn't really help this. So Jonas Nam's great book on this, I think, is really, really good. That essentially, if you look at China and the EU, why would you bet on them for green tech? Because they both have large export sectors, and those export sectors have coalitionable politics that would actually make it possible to bind those workers into the green transition. And one of the examples Jonas uses is that, for, by his estimates, 40% of the Mittelstand's output already goes into green tech. They don't care where the ball bearing goes, right? It can be in a diesel engine, it can be in a windmill. If that's going to be the growth of the future, we'll go with the windmills. The United States doesn't have that capacity. It doesn't have the vision, and it has an anti-politics that's allergic to it. So I think that when you go through that, the, the short-term ROI on the carbon binge is going to be incredible, right? Europe's going to suffer food shortages. It's going to have migrant problems. It's going to have security problems. It's going to have all this over the next 10 years, but it's going to continue to decarbonize. That's going to happen. I really believe that's going to happen. The United States is self-sufficient in food, self-sufficient in field. They're a net export on both. They're going to double down on the old business model. The, the dollar will rally. It will be super strong. The, consequently, the imports will just flood into the country. It will power the rest, of the, the rest of the global economy. Everything will look great, except there's one thing that's going on. The only industries that matter are the ones that you will never develop. That's when you lose hegemony. That's how you lose it by degree. OK, thank you very much. Um... We're going to have a small break now until the beginning of the panel sessions. Um, just to mention, the people who are uh, presenting maybe show up like 10 minutes later to set up, set up your PowerPoints and, and there's an online streaming. Um, the one, the first panel that is in the program is not happening. It's changed. Uh, it happened yesterday, for those of you who didn't notice. So we only have two. Um, the central banks and climate change starting, and then uh, another legal <coughs> aspect of central banking. And then today, in contrast to yesterday, we do have lunch after the panel sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful keynote. Thank you all. And see you all soon. <laughs>